Hello everyone, and welcome to this virtual world building workshop, World Building Without Info Dumping. My name is Claire, and I'll be talking about what I feel world building is, what are some common pitfalls when incorporating world building into your prose, and how to build up a world as you write a scene. First things first, who am I to be talking to you about this? I am an author of primarily fantasy. I write mostly young adult novels and mostly adult short stories. You can check out the links to my shorts via my website down at the bottom here. Most of them are free to read. Two of my novels are secondary world fantasy, and I think you can guess which ones. The third is a contemporary thriller, and we'll be talking mostly about world building in the sense of creating a world today, but it's important to remember that world building in a contemporary setting is also very important, making people feel as though they're in the place you describe, as though they could wake up there tomorrow, navigate the streets, even if they've never been there before. One of the things people seem to like about my books is their world building, how the worlds function, how I incorporate world building into my novels. So that's something of what I thought I would talk about today in terms of process. Of course, we know that world building is the process of developing a cohesive world for our speculative or non-speculative work. It is a set of rules we need to define to get people on board with our space opera, our epic fantasy, our grim dystopia, whatever. But I like to break down world building into three broad parts. What readers envision as they read, what we as the author need to know in order to make this cohesive world readers envision, and finally, how we can use language to reinforce our world. When we look at world building in a superficial way, it's what readers see in their mind's eye when they read the book, how people dress, what your physical location looks like, hopefully how things smell, taste, and feel. It also applies to the setup. What are the rules of your magic system, your interstellar travel, or your dystopian government? It is essentially what will draw readers in and make them feel immersed. So despite it seeming maybe superficial, it is a very important part, right? But underneath that surface, things have to make sense as well. And that's where we get to point number two. What do we need to know to make sure readers get a coherent world? If our characters wear wool, what does that mean? Does it mean that our space heroes are wealthy because they can afford something that's not synthetic? Does it mean that our fantasy characters live in a cold place with a lot of sheep? Sometimes the answer can be very simple, right? Um, when you write a scene where your character goes to the market, how do they pay for things, for example, and what's available at the market? And what would a barter or banking system look like in the world you've created? That's the sort of under the surface stuff I think about. And when I'm writing a first draft of a scene, I like to interrogate myself every time I come to a new world building element. How does this work? Why am I writing it the way that I am? And sometimes this interrogation leads to problems, like I have contradicting information, or I have a contradicting atmosphere in my world building, right? I'm trying to combine two uh, sort of settings that don't work, or two time period, or pieces of inspiration from time periods that don't work, right? When I'm interrogating myself, I can work that out instead of accidentally leaving something in that gives the reader a muddled sense of how the world works or confuses them. So it's important to note on this point, I'm interrogating myself, I'm creating the world behind my presented world, but that's not necessarily information that has to make it into the final draft of the story. These are things I have to know. As an author, readers don't necessarily have to know this stuff. And finally, language can support our world building in fun and interesting ways. This is something that I think about more when I'm polishing my manuscript, making sure each word 
is right where I want it. Using language to support the atmosphere of the world, both in physical and in thematic or characteristic terms, that can help give this feeling of cohesiveness that will further immerse the reader. So the author Lee Bardugo, who wrote the Grisha trilogy and Six of Crows and the Ninth House, uh, she once described the way she wrote a character. This character came from a warmer land to a colder one. And a lot of cold metaphors and cold language, it wasn't really in her vocabulary. So when she spoke, or when we had a chapter from her point of view, she saw and expressed the world in a different way from others. It's pretty smart. World building is a huge endeavor. I think some people tend to err on the side of description, right? We've created this magic system, this history, maybe even languages for your world. Uh, we probably have a lot of complex systems in the world. So how much of that does the reader actually need to see? I have stolen a metaphor, shamelessly, from Brandon Sanderson. He says that when readers see world building, they see it as you might see an iceberg, right? The metaphor of the iceberg is that 10% of it is above the water, 90% of it is below the surface of the water. And in the same way with a story, readers see the tip of your world building. And if it's done right, they're confident that there's this big chunk of world building lurking below the surface of your novel. So maybe they don't know why something is, the way that it is in your world, but they're confident that you know. And here's an even better secret, right? Your world building iceberg can be hollow on the inside. Unlike a real iceberg, you don't need solid wall to wall facts to make it a stable world. You just have to construct something that readers are going to see as solid. So sometimes in world building, less can be more as long as you know what the more is. Or you can convince your readers what the more is. <clears throat> now, world building is a big task, and a lot of people spend hours upon hours constructing gorgeous worlds with long histories, intricate political relations, all of these different things. Uh, you can do that if you want, um, but just because it's world building that you've done doesn't mean it has to go into the story, right? And just because you have all this information doesn't mean your reader needs to know it right away before they've read far enough into the story in order for your world to make sense. Info dumping is one of the big pitfalls of, write, of world building, right? It's something that a lot of authors do, especially when we're just starting out. Info dumping is, of course, having these long paragraphs of history and geography and other information about your world. And a lot of authors who info dump think this information is foundational, right? That readers have to know this in order to understand the context of the story. The problem is readers are going to forget whatever isn't relevant right away. And then 300 pages later, I may reveal something big that relies on world building you read in the prologue, and you won't have any idea what I'm talking about. Readers often get a sense that nothing is happening when a big info dump is going on as well, especially when the info dump is part of a prologue or sitting at the beginning of a novel. So that is really why info dumps can be quite problematic, right? Now I'm assuming that you joined a workshop called world building without info dumping because you're not really interested in the info dump. But if you think it can be put to good use as an info dump, well, you are right. Occasionally I've seen good books that have used the info dump to a really nice effect, right? I'd particularly recommend Terry Pratchett for this, who starts out a few of his Discworld books with these long descriptions of the great turtle Atuin and the journey across the universe. And you can always research what makes a good info dump if you're interested in doing it. And of course, you can always lean into it in your own writing if that's your style. I am confident that I'm not the next Terry Pratchett, so I do try to avoid info dumps. Um, aside from info dumps, one of the other big 
world building pitfalls is, as you know, Bob or Maid and Butler Talk. It is also called. This is usually a method of world building through dialogue or presenting your world through dialogue. And the problem with it is that the two people talking already know all the information that they're talking about. They're just having this conversation so that the reader can catch up. So that's why it's called As You Know, Bob. It usually starts with something like, as you know, the evil empire fell 500 years ago, and since then we've had this glorious kingdom. And then Bob says, ah, yes, but now the king has died with no heir. As you know, all his wicked cousins are vying for the throne. And it's very clumsy as a way to get information across. Readers can often tell that that's what you're doing. And I personally feel that one of the big things you don't want to do with your world building is make it obvious to readers that you are world building. So you don't want to make it too obvious, right? World building through dialogue definitely can happen. People use it all the time. Uh, some of the classics are like a student mentor uh, sort of situation where the student must tell the mentor what they know, or oftentimes the author gets around this issue completely by making the main character an outsider. So the main character has to be introduced to things that would be obvious to the other people in your world. And in that way, it doesn't seem so awkward that people would be explaining things through dialogue. So these two pitfalls, just a note about them. They're not great to see in a final draft, but you know, when you're writing a first draft, always give yourself some leeway. Sometimes just getting the information down on the page is what you need to do. And if that's what you need to do, do it, go back later and refine when you're making your revisions and figure out exactly what needs to go where, right? So with this in mind, how exactly do we put world building into a text without having some long info dump or an awkward conversation? Well, let us get started on our exercise for this workshop. We are going to make a pot of tea together. So the simple act of boiling water and making a pot of tea can actually tell us a lot about someone's world while incorporating action and possibly even like dialogue if you have two or more characters present during your tea making. Uh, we're gonna start with the basics, right? And build up our world from there. So for tea, you need water to boil. So where does our water come from? Does it come from the tap? Maybe it comes from the recycler. Water is scarce, maybe we're in space. Uh, maybe it comes from the well outside. Maybe it comes from the tears of angels, which are continuously falling on the earth following some great catastrophe, right? Once we know where our water comes from, we have to figure out how to get our water from its source to the heat. So we have to collect it in something. Is that a ladle, a bucket, a kettle, or a cup? Right? When we're heating up our water, what do we heat it in? Is it a classic fire? Uh, maybe we're using magic to heat it. Maybe we're using the blazing heat of a fire bug. Right? Do we heat it in the same receptacle we fetched it in? A kettle or a ladle or something? Do we transfer it to something else? Some special fancy space age infuser or just a regular one? Right? And of course, even the kind of tea. When we say we're making tea, that can mean a lot of different things. It could be the classic green black tea that we have on earth. That's sort of the very specific kind of tea, or it could be some kind of herbal in tea or infusion that we picked by hand from the mountains, right? Was it expensive or difficult to acquire the tea? Maybe it has some kind of special meaning for it as well. And of course, like the rest of the kitchen space, what does that look like? Are we in a trailer park home, a space pod? Maybe we're shivering outdoors with no kitchen to speak of, but a fire in the snow, right? All of these things will, you know, we're encapsulating making this very 
small and perhaps mundane activity, but even this small and mundane activity will say a lot about what world we are living in and what world we want the reader to be living in. And just through going, you know, just going through the act of describing how we make a pot of tea, readers get an idea of what they expect from us. So with that in mind, we're going to end the session with a little bit of practice. Now it's your turn to make a pot of tea or coffee or ractagino or whatever. To finish off this session, your assignment is to take about 15 minutes. You're gonna write a scene in which your character is making a pot of something. Uh, feel free to use this as a way to brainstorm a new world without pressure. You can also use a world you've been developing to practice getting it down on the page or just use it as like a writing exercise, right? As your character goes through the movements of the tea making routine, you can show off what the world is like for them. Now, the biggest thing about world building is that it doesn't happen on its own. The scene is not going to be as interesting if you're only going through the motions of making a pot of tea. If it's only there to make sure the readers know what kind of world we're working with, it's getting kind of into info dump territory. So a good scene always has some kind of like conflict in it. It could be a conflict within your character. Maybe the very act of making a pot of tea is a cause for conflict within them. Uh, maybe your character is at conflict with a hostile environment. So making tea is a physical struggle. Or of course, it can be a conflict with another person. If you're not sure what to do, I have a little prompt for you. Have your character making a pot of tea while your main character is making a pot of tea, another character enters the scene. And the last time these two characters spoke, they fought. And you get to decide what did they fight about, whether they continue to fight in this scene or they try to resolve their fight or just pretend that it never happened. And you get to decide how the conflict comes through. And most importantly, you get to slip in world building details around this conflict so that it becomes part of an engaging whole rather than a separated info dump that needs to be incorporated. Remember, in addition to visual details, things like smell, taste, of course, with the tea, maybe the feel of things, right? The feel of the heat and so on. Remember to incorporate other uh, physical sensations, right? Uh, as part of your world building. And otherwise, I hope you have fun with the assignment. I hope you got something out of this little uh, seminar. I'm sorry we can't be going through it in person and having lots of fun making stuff up, but if you have questions or want to get in touch with me, you can always do that. You can contact me via my website, again, down at the bottom of the page here, if you have further questions. So good luck with your world building and good luck with your manuscripts.